Okay, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, this is now webinar number 11. Uh, my name is Alex Pacini. I'm the Business Development Manager and Water Treatment Specialist here at AWC Solutions. Uh, today, we're going to be covering thermal desalination. Um, we, our guest is going to be BJ. Thanks again for being here, BJ. Um, I've got to be honest, um, I've been in the water industry now for 10 plus years, and I've done a lot of different technologies all over the world, and I have yet to do thermal desalination, so thank you for being here. This is, I, I think, uh, this is going to be a very interesting technology. Sure. So a quick little background on um, the webinars that we're going to be going through. Um, we've already been covering a few of them. This is part of the schedule that we're going through. Um, as I've mentioned, we started with uh, doing a series of 12. We're going to be kind of exploring a few more options here. A little background, AWC, for anybody that hasn't been with us. for close 40 years. We have close to 600 water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants worldwide. Um, everything is manufactured in British Columbia. And kind of divide everything into um, multiple categories on the modular wastewater. So we have um, modular water um, treatment for potable. Uh, we've got our wastewater and of course we've got our skid mounted. Now we typically look at desalination as primarily either a skid mounted or reverse osmosis and today we're going to be focusing on a very different technology as you can see it's something very outside of our particular toolbox and that's why we have uh, Vijay coming in so today we're going to be focusing on thermal desalination and with that Vijay take it away it's all yours sure uh, thanks Alex uh, I'll just share my screen Sounds good uh, good morning all good afternoon uh, again my name is uh, Vijay Ahire, and uh, I'm with uh, ID Technologies working as a technical sales uh, manager uh, based in Houston. Uh, first of all, uh, hope you all are safe and healthy during this uh, COVID situation and uh, be safe and take care of your family. Uh, today, I'm going to present this thermal technology. Let me go to my slides. Okay. Before I roll into it, uh, very high level uh, about IDE. Uh, we are an Israel-based company, uh, primarily known for uh, seawater desalination uh, in both uh, uh, RO membranes and uh, MVC, MED thermal technologies. And uh, we were established in 1965. We have more than 400 installations in over 40 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in US, uh, particularly, we are known for uh, this um, Carlsbad desalination plant, and that's where we have our office in uh, US. So my uh, presentation today is uh, for uh, thermal desalination, and uh, today I'm very glad to present this very exciting technology called as thermal desalination. Please note, uh, this will be a very uh, brief presentation or explanation of this technology, and uh, I'll be available later on you know, if you have any questions or you want to take a deeper dive later on, I'll be more than happy to do so later on. But however, I can, I can assure you that in the end, uh, you will have some good basic understandings of the science behind this uh, thermal technology. So before I get into the details, these two pictures right here, let me share uh, the pointer here. Yeah, this is a MVC technology, which is uh, referred as mechanical vapor compression. And on the left, it is called as MED, which is multi-effect. The scientific terms behind these two technology is evaporation or evaporator. So that's what we are going to learn today. All right, so let's get into the technology now. This slide is, uh, can I request you all to put yourself on mute because I still hear some uh, sound, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, give, right. me, give me a second here, BJ. There's a few people that uh, can't see the screen. One second. Oh, uh, can everybody I... see the screen? Yeah, everybody can see it? Yeah, okay, sorry, go ahead. Maybe... Maybe I'll off my video. Uh, is my video off, uh, Alex? No, no, we can see it here. No, my video, I mean, uh, my camera, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, ca camera's off, but we can see the presentation. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. okay, so I just want to make sure because sometimes this camera, okay. Um, 
All right, so let's get into the technology. Uh, this slide, you, as you all know, this is meant uh, to present the distillation in nature. Uh, and that's the science behind the thermal desalination. So there is a evaporation, there is a condensation, and uh, the rain, which is a pure form of water, is a distilled water that we get from uh, this process. In a nutshell, though, similar concept is used or utilized through a mechanical or a thermal means and treat the high TDS or uh, very high brackish water TDS water to produce a distilled water. So same concept. Okay. What is the purpose of desalination? First of all, the purpose is basically we need to treat the feed water such as seawater or high level TDS water. For instance, uh, we can use reverse osmosis up to like 40,000, 45,000 ppm TDS of uh, water. But beyond that, what's the technology? So that's where the thermal technology comes into picture. So uh, let's take a case here. We have a feed water and we need to treat this water now uh, to remove the TDS. So you need to heat the water to 100 degrees C in order to boil it, then cool or condense it, and then we can get a distilled water here. There is a brine stream coming out, which is a salt or reject that is highly concentrated and that needs some disposal. Do you think this is a good case of treatment? Maybe not, maybe yes. Why? Because this 212 degree Fahrenheit temperature is pretty hot for any desalination. And this is due to the fact, you know, like you need a very robust and compatible material, first of all. That means it will add capex or, you know, uh, for the entire system. And on top of that, it will add scaling just because there is a higher temperature involved in that. So it is not economical at all. So how do we deal with this? OK, so design the evaporator at a very optimum temperature. When I say optimum temperature, lower than the boiling point of the water. So that will basically, number one, it will mitigate the risk of scaling. Then we are able to use a very cost effective material of constructions and on top of that the most important thing is and i'm going to show that in the end of my presentation when i show you the multi-effect distillation technology whenever there is any cheap or low grade heat source available for instance in a power plant we have um, you know this back pressure from the steam turbine and all that we can utilize that heat source and heat the water so this becomes a highly economical system and that's why it is operated at a very optimum design temperature. OK, so now that you understand the science behind this, uh, let's look what really happens into the technology. Let's roll into it. So you see this, uh, you see, if you follow my cursor right here, this is the tube, OK, and the water that needs a treatment is a cold fluid, OK? it will be spread on the top of the tube. Again, these tube bundles, I'll show you in a bit, you know, these are all configured in a vessel, but I'm just showing you one pressure, uh, one tube to give you idea what exactly happens. So the water vapor, the hot fluid enters in the tube, inside the tube, and the field water that needs the treatment, it spread over the tube. And what happens here? There is a heat out, condensation. The vapor loses its heat. So there is a latent heat of transfer between these two fluids, OK? The water vapor loses the heat, that is condensation. And the, the water that is being spread, it will evaporate. And what's the driving force here? Basically, it is uh, the hot temperature minus the cold temperature, which is uh, about 5 degree Fahrenheit. So remember, it's a very critical to design such system because the driving force matters a lot, OK? And this is how the technology is developed, and that is how it is configured in a horizontal falling film evaporator. If I further elaborate this through an animation, you can see how the heat transfer occurs. So this slide presents the steady state operation uh, of evaporation method or system. Now, follow the water vapor that is flowing through the tube. As it passes through the tube and as the cold water is spread over the tube, the vapor loses the heat, meaning there is a condensation, right? 
and the feed water on the other hand absorbs the heat meaning the evaporation so you can notice that t in and t out balances the temperature difference okay and that serves as a driving force for efficient performance of this system so this is in general how the principle is conducted in any evaporator technology okay so we'll get into the real technology now now that you know the science behind this and the technology how it is done let's uh, look at what happens here so this slide presents the main components of the falling film evaporator first of all this is a horizontal falling film evaporator if you follow my cursor this is the vessel this is the vapor compressor this is the heat exchanger this is condenser or deaerator and these are few pumps and uh, the piping the tubes if you see here are configured in horizontal configuration those are bundled up in the vessel this is first stage and this is the second stage so what happens here so feed water that needs treatment removal of tds it enters into a heat exchanger it's a plate and frame type heat exchanger okay the purpose of this heat exchanger is basically the distillate which is leaving out the system anyways is hot and we don't want to lose that energy correct we want to utilize that energy so how are we going to utilize it so we will exchange the temperature of this distillate with the feed meaning it's a heat recovery section uh, heat is recovered the feed water is heated and that is very important and critical just because it will increase the overall efficiency and performance of the system after the water is heated it goes to a deaerator or a condenser wherein the incisis incisis meaning non condensable gases are taken out so this is called as air removal system and after that once that is taken out because that may corrode the system or scale the system so it's very important that we take those uh, gases out after the condenser there is a circulation pump if you see my cursor here it will take the suction from the deaerator and then the actual process begins so right here the water will be pumped from this uh, circulation pump it will be spread over top of the tubes the steam which is coming from the compressor will enter the tubes so that the steam is or the water vapor is inside the tubes and the water is spread over the top of the tubes when the water is spread on the top of the tubes there is a continuous uh, formation of a thin layer you know and that falls from the top to bottom and that's why it is called as horizontal falling film type evaporators if you can see in this picture um, there are two effects right there is uh, on the right side that's the first effect which is uh, hot because you know you are getting the steam directly into here and then there is a next stage just to let you know for any mechanical compression type units you, uh, the limitation is number of stages it we can go up to two stages or we can the max we can go up to three stages just because of the limitation of uh, this compressor size okay so as i mentioned uh, previously the steam enters through the tubes the water on the top and there is a latent heat of transfer so there is a condensation and evaporation the vapor which is now formed here it you know will flow from first stage to the second stage right and at the same time the water which is uh, falling or trickling down from top to bottom it's getting highly concentrated just because it's a brine now it will be getting collected here and there is another recirculation pump set of recirculation pump it will again spray the water on the top so we have two effects here basically the steam which is coming here it is heating and then the vapors flowing from the first phase or the first stage to the second stage and from here uh, there is a compressor the, the use of compressor is basically it will help uh, to provide uh, pressure lower than the equilibrium pressure and it provides the necessary you know heating media in the first effect uh then the condensed vapor you know this is the distilled water from both the effects is collected right here and then it goes out as the pure distilled form similarly the brine which is uh, highly concentrated now will go out from here 
just to give an example if you are dealing with seawater about 50000 ppm tds we can get up to maybe 75 80% recovery again depending on the tds and uh, accordingly the system will be designed the distillate we can get up to maybe less than 5 ppm less than 10 ppm tds so it's a very good quality water coming out of any horizontal falling film you operator so this is how it works if you can see the vapors going out uh this picture shows you know the feed water is being sprayed over the tube bundles this is the spray nozzle that's being sprayed on the tubes uh this two picture shows uh the falling film over the tube bundles uh, that's how it flows and the tubes are configured in a horizontal configuration this is how the entire u operator assembly looks like if you follow this this is the vessel main vessel and uh, this is the compressor these are the vapor ducts that are means of providing the vapor to the unit this is the deaerator for removal of non condensable gases these are all the piping and all that and this is the platform for the operator to operate the system the beauty of uh, horizontal u operator is uh, the pressure drop is comparatively lower uh, if you compare that with the vertical type u operators plus uh, uh, it's at the operation level so it's pretty uh, efficient way of operating the system for the operators these are few uh, examples or pictures that will show you how it is configured or assembled this is one of the unit that we uh, supplied in a sagd market in uh, canada and this was designed for about 250 cubic meters per day and if you see the vessel is on the top and uh, the skid is on the bottom the operator can operate the system very fairly easily again few pictures of the same system uh, this is one of the project that we did in winterschall germany about 220 gallons per minute this was for the produce water wherein the uh, feed salinity was about 70000 ppm and the brine salinity were about 13% uh this is one of the project where we did in shengli that was also for the produce water application uh for 920 gallons per minute total the reason i wanted to share this picture is because you know if it is cold or if you want to basically uh you uh, make it user friendly for the operators we can put a uh, enclosure a uh, sort of enclosure here wherein the operators can um, you know use that for operating the system but in nutshell this shows how the mvc system works overall this is another picture for a system that we uh, supplied in india for uh, 675000 uh, gallons per day so we learn the mvc technology which is the mechanical vapor compression now we'll roll into the multi effect distillation technology and uh, i think i have i i'll i'll go it as fast as i can okay so what is med so med is nothing but this is a series of uh, evaporators and it is combined with a condenser so what's the difference between med versus a uh, mvc in mvc you saw there is a compressor which is a means of providing the heat or water vapor for heating the water here let's say for instance if you have a power plant wherein uh, you have about um, 15 psi or even 5 psi of uh, absolute pressure steam available we can use that low grade heat and heat the system and use that as a media to uh, treat the feed water so what happens here is it utilizes a similar principle uh, of evaporation technology and includes a series of uh, evaporation with a combination of condenser or a heat recovery section so there are several effects or stages where the evaporation condensation you know takes place in a successive steps in the vessels and it takes place at a slightly lower temperature pressure liquid uh, you know vapor equilibrium point uh the steam or heat source that is available is used as the heating media and it enters the first uh, effect and so on so what happens let's say the sea water or the feed water enters here which is the last effect or a condenser wherein it's a sort of a heat exchanger wherein the latent heat of the entire system is transferred and it cools down the same time the feed water is being heated and a group of uh, uh, you know effects can be utilized 
to um, treat the water. So we have this first effect wherein uh, you can see there are three vessels. Uh, the pump, the water can pump, uh, can be pumped through this uh, recirculation pump or a circulation pump on top of the vessel. It's a similar principle, and uh, uh, you know the only difference I can say is the beauty of this is it can go up to like 15 stages. So let's say if you have a one ton of steam available, you can produce about 15 tons of uh, distillate or product water. So in a nutshell. This is the multi-effect distillation technology, which is combination of the evaporation. The only difference, again, I want to reiterate is uh, this is this comes at a very uh, high level of uh, stages. Number of stages can be increased. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll just show you some pictures here. This is uh, one of the system that we supplied in Reliance India. Uh, th this was designed for 11 effect in series. And the reason I wanted to share you the picture so that you can get a fair idea how the system looks like. Uh, these are the heat supply options that can be utilized for the MED system. And uh, as I mentioned, that's why it is very important for any U operator system to design at a very optimum temperature. And that gives us uh, leverage uh, to use this low steam pressure. Uh, these are again few pictures of one of our plant in China, uh, one of the system in Reliance and I think Alex that's all I have now for you know if you have any questions feel free to ask me and again as I mentioned I know this was very high level but I'm more than happy to kind of go through a deeper dive and I can explain you in much detail this system. Excellent thank you Vijay. So um, that was a great presentation. Of course, we're covering a very different and new technology for us um, here. So we're gonna go ahead and open the floor for some questions. If anybody has some questions, you can put them into the chat box or uh, don't be shy. You can uh, turn on your camera and um, if you have any questions, go ahead. Um, in the meantime, I do have a question here um, and I was taking some notes. So on the pre-filtration front, um, I'm very familiar with your traditional seawater reverse osmosis. Um, treatment. Would you use a different technology or would you pre-treat the water to a different uh, standard, a water quality standard, if you're using a membrane uh, versus thermal desalination? Uh, that's a great question, Alex. Uh, first of all, uh, if I really compare this technology with the RO, uh, as you all know, there are some limitations and there are some advantages, pros and cons with the RO system. Number one, uh, the RO is limited to the influent TDS, meaning uh, it can only take the TDS up to 40,000 to 45,000 to the max because uh, the brine uh, TDS needs to be about 7 to 8% and that really drives the recovery. So if you have more uh, TDS in the water, this system can be used, uh, the evaporator system, and we can go up to like in the brine, 200,000 or 220,000 uh, or maybe 20% I can say uh, in the brine. So that gives you a very higher recovery. Number two, we can use a low grade waste heat available that cannot be used in RO. And if that's the case, the power consumption is extremely lower in uh, this case. Now you asked me about the pretreatment. Certainly, yeah, I mean, there has to be some pretreatment, but not uh, really uh, like RO because in RO, we really need to take care of everything because we have to uh, control the HDI to less than three or five. So we can have a TSS uh, uh, removal, like a filter or something upstream of the MVC, or sometimes if there is extreme oil, we need to remove the oil to that extent. But other than that, this is a pretty stable and robust system for removal of the TDS. Excellent. Okay, well, since we gave everybody a few minutes to answer, apparently we have a whole long list of, of questions. So I'm just, just going to pick the top uh, two for now, and then we can, anybody that wants to stick around, we're going to leave kind of a, a lobby. Uh, we can finish, end the presentation, and anybody that wants to stay and ask some more questions, we can do that. So the first one here, I have what should be easy. It says historically, what came first, MED or MVC? And why a need was felt to go beyond? So why did one transition to the other? So historically, uh, well, the conceptually, it was uh, evaporator technology, as I mentioned, and the concept is similar, okay? Now, MED evolved when uh, the people or the industrial folks, they realized that, you know what, there is a steam available that is anyways being wasted, right? 
so how can we utilize the steam first of all so essentially that was mec came into picture uh, because of the distillation in nature and the compressor actually really drive the needs of med just because it has limitations it cannot go beyond two or three stages so number one when the uh, the guys you know the folks saw in the industrial application that the steam is just wasted why can't we use that as a heating media and that's how the med evolve into um, the industrial applications okay um, and then i have another question here from bob and the question is can solar thermal be a source of heat um uh, that could be but uh, the issue is uh, how are we going to con constantly supply that uh, source because what happens is during the night time you know uh, it won't be available so we need to uh, worry about the storage of that right so when you do the economics sometimes it may not uh, worked out in favor of the solar energy just because the storage volumes are so much that uh, that just kills the economy but to answer it can be utilized it just the matter that how that project feasibility works out in terms of economics and whether there is a, a means that can be stored or the economy is feasible in that perspective okay and before we wrap up i'm going to go through one last question here which i thought was a very good question was how sensitive are these technologies either one to bacteria or algae uh, fouling that's a good question and uh, that's very subjective just because we need to figure out the nature of the organics first you know and uh, once we realize that we need to have some treat pre treatment just because what happens is sometimes uh, the bacteria or uh, you know that organics may uh, come out as a volatile you know when it hits right there is a, a volatile components that will emerge and we need to really look into the each case of that nature and then design the system so okay yeah yeah okay well thank you yeah you're right that does answer the question okay so we're going to go ahead and wrap up again if anybody wants to stay um, later we can continue going through some of the questions but we need to be mindful of our by these time so again i want to thank you vj for for coming for everybody um there is his contact information is up on the screen along with mine uh we also have a very um active uh, linkedin channel so go ahead and follow us on there for next week, we're going to be covering moving bed bioreactors for October 1st. That's going to be on Thursday, and we're going to be doing it with John Sainis. And um, we are we have recently launched, I'm going to a quick plug here. We just recently launched um, AWC's YouTube channel, where all of these recordings are going to be uh, listed in there shortly. Um, you'll be getting an email reminder with today's session so that you can follow up if, if you've missed anything or share it with your group, anybody that's missed it, it's in there. Uh, please subscribe, please comment. Uh, any questions in there would, I would um, be greatly appreciated. So with that, thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording and say goodbye here. Um, and we can uh, take it away if anybody wants to stick around uh, with some more follow-up questions. Okay, so thanks again and see you next week.